Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Vanna Zervanos, and I am the Associate Dean at the Erevan K. Hobbs School of Business at St. Joseph's University. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight's webinar, Democracy on the Table, Are We Facing a New Illiberal World Order? Which is the second in a three-part series exploring the threats, opportunities, limits, and future of democracy at home and around the world. For tonight's installment, our panel will discuss China, Russia, and the possibility of a new illiberal global order in a post-pandemic world. The Hobbes School of Business at St. Joseph's University has been a proud supporter and partner of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia for many years, and we are delighted to support the Council's mission of bringing global education and civil discourse to our community through conversations like tonight's discussion and the series. And as the Council's motto says, democracy demands discourse, we at St. Joseph's University are happy to be a part of that conversation. And at the Hobbes School of Business, we strive to teach our students how to be engaged citizens and leaders. I'm now going to turn it over to Lauren Schwartz, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, who will further introduce tonight's panelists. Great, so thank you, Vanna. And I'd like to take a minute to thank you personally, as well as all of your colleagues at St. Joe's and Dean Joseph D'Angelo and the Hobbes School of Business for serving as our education sponsor for this series on democracy. We're always grateful to work with St. Joe's and to welcome your faculty and staff, like we have joining us tonight as a panelist, and the students to these events, even in these virtual times. And during this most challenging academic year, over 30 St. Joseph students have still risen to the occasion and signed up to become a mentor to nearly 200 middle school students across our region to help them learn about foreign affairs and international topics in our Global Smarts Mentoring Program. We do need big, bold thinkers out there to tackle topics like the future of democracy, and St. Joe's is creating them on their own campus and middle, school, middle schools throughout our region. And I'd also like to thank our series corporate sponsor, KeyBank, for their long-time commitment to the council's mission of bringing global education and civil discourse to Philadelphians of all ages and backgrounds. Without support from partners like KeyBank and St. Joseph's, we couldn't do what we do. And of course, I'm delighted to welcome our members here this evening, the members of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia and the other guests from around the region and the world. We are bringing you fresh, nonpartisan civil discourse on the critical issues affecting the world. The World Affairs Council platform will continue to serve as your home for respectful and deep discussions on the complex issues facing the world today. And lastly, a special welcome to the high school students, college students, and teachers who participate in the Council's education programs throughout the year. We work with nearly 3,000 youth each year to provide foreign affairs and international education across four states. These students are not just the leaders of the future, but as we've seen recently, they are the leaders of today. And later, we'll hear from Noelle McClellan, a junior at Julia R. Masterman High School in Philadelphia, who will post our first audience question to the panel. Now, if you have any technical issues during the program, please use the questions bar and the Council's Vice President of Programs, Haley Boyle, will help you behind the scenes. You can also use the questions bar to send questions for our panelists at any time. And after the moderated discussion, we'll get to as many questions of yours as possible. I'd like to briefly introduce tonight's panelists for our discussion on whether and how democracy is on the table around the world. This weekend's news from Ethiopia and Peru to our own contested election and beyond surely indicate why this is exactly what we should be talking about right now. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Lisa Baglioni, who serves as Professor of Political Science at St. Joseph's University. Lisa has wide ranging scholarly interests from global security, Russian and American foreign policy, gender and politics, and Russian and post-communist policies to pedagogy. Dr. Christopher Lane is a University Distinguished Professor of International Affairs and the Robert M. Gates Chair in National Security at the Bush School of Government and the Public Service at, at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. His fields of interest are international relations theory, great power politics, U.S. foreign policy, and grand strategy. It sounds like you're in the right place, Chris. And we also welcome Dr. Bobo Lowe, a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute. He is an independent analyst and an associate research fellow with the Russia NIS Center at the French Institute of International Relations. He was previously head of the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House, 
and Deputy Head of Mission at the Australian Embassy in Moscow. Welcome to you all. We'll start with some brief opening remarks from each of you, followed by some moderated discussion and end with audience Q&A. Lisa, can we start opening remarks with you, please? Yes, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's hard not to believe that we are facing a new illiberal world order. Institutions carefully constructed over the last seven and a half decades are under attack from the trading and financial systems to the European Union, to the American Alliance system, to multilateral efforts designed to resolve common threats. Although many challenges remain, there are some reasons for hope today. I will mention two of each. First, contemporary security challenges share some similarities with the old which were complex enough, but additional problems have emerged that require attention and creative solutions. Coercive power worked well for some of the old threats and will remain effective in certain instances, but it is not a panacea. Stopping climate change and staunching pandemics require additional tools. While American unilateralism and unwillingness to accept the reality of shared fates have been impediments to solutions, so too has been the opposition to employing other forms of power, such as in enticing states to work together with rewards and punishments, revisioning problems and solutions, empowering others to act, or behaving in ways that encourage em emulation of good conduct. Democratic states know and have used these instruments before and can harness them again to repair the liberal order. Second, the internal weaknesses of democracies make acting creatively harder. Domestic political leaderships, moneyed interests, new technologies, and the hollowing out of educational systems have contributed to polarization and the inability of large segments of the public to discern and value truth. In addition, the pursuit of neoliberal economics means that the dream of inclusion and advancement is out of reach for far too many. And with the help of polarizing leaders and pernicious external actors, citizens look to blame someone for their hardships. Combating these challenges is extremely complicated, but now for some glimmers of hope. While the old order was far from perfect, its foundational principles are sound. Coming out of World War II, Western leaders believed that instability and war resulted from economic dislocation, uncertain commitments to the security and well-being of friends, and inadequate military preparations. Bretton Woods, NATO, the EU, and the East, and the East Asian Alliance addressed those weaknesses, creating mutually reinforcing zones of prosperity, democracy, and security. That formula was incredibly successful for the states involved and ideas for building on these approaches in other regions must be advanced. These global commitments had domestic counterparts that call for political democracy and, and a market underpinned by a state that served as a guarantor of not only rights, but also of improving material conditions for citizens. Under this renewed liberal order, states must do more to remedy the way that social practices and norms block the prosperity of historically disadvantaged groups. Finally, a ray of light comes from the Biden victory. The incoming administration imagines an engaged and liberal America. Such a US is essential for reconstructing a liberal global order, but given the pandemic, among other problems, the US is handicapped. Whether that deficit can be overcome and illiberal trends reversed are unclear. Progress depends on whether leaders put aside political ambitions and work to promote health, welfare, and liberal principles. Each day that officials avoid recognizing the outcome of this election is another day that the fabric of American democracy and the global liberal system further unravels. It's another day that we lose in rebuilding a liberal order as sickness, poverty, and the risk of violence mounts. Thank you, and I look forward to our conversation. Um, thank you very much to Dean Cervanos and to President Schwartz for setting up this event, and I appreciate the invitation and the chance to participate, and also Welcome my co-panelists, Professor Baglioni and Professor Lowe. Um, you know, I woke up four years ago, right after the election, and uh, scanned the newspapers and the ones that I read every day, either in print or online, and there was a flood of articles, um, op-ed pieces, about the end of the liberal international order. 
and that was attributed to the election of Donald Trump. I think the concern about the future of the liberal international order is warranted, and it certainly has not died down since 2016. But I think there's a lot deeper problem that's causing this than just Donald Trump. Now, the United States at the end of World War II enjoyed its first unipolar moment when it was dominant economically, militarily, and in terms of its soft power. Uh, and it was at that high point of American power that the post-war international order, call it either the Pax Americana or the liberal rules-based international order, one and the same, was founded on the basis of American power. The reason that there is a crisis today and that we debate the future of this order is that the foundations, the geopolitical and economic foundations on which that order was constructed have begun to atrophy. And it's inevitable, uh, particularly with the rise of China, uh, that there is going to be a shift to a different kind of order because that order is going to be shaped by the rising power, not the declining one. And unfortunately, the United States is a declining power in today's international order. Um, we also face a second prong. Not only is the liberal international order under assault because of these changing geopolitical conditions, but also as we see in both uh, Europe and the United States, there's been a significant domestic backlash. Um, income inequality, deindustrialization, uh, for the United States, a sense that we take on too many of the world's burdens and others don't do enough of their share. All of these things have sort of contributed to domestic disillusionment with the liberal international order. But I, I would say that the primary issue, the primary driver of change is the changing distribution of power in the international system. The west to east shift of power away from the Euro-Atlantic world to, to East Asia, particularly China. So I don't think that's going to change. And I think if that is, in fact, the direction in which the geopolitical system is headed, that we are going to see fundamental changes to the international system that uh, may not be entirely to Americans' liking. All right. And Bobo, opening remarks. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Lauren, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I want to briefly address three questions. Uh, the first is, what is the state of global order? The second is, who is responsible for the crisis of global order? And the third is, what are we going to do about it? So quickly on the state of global order. I think the liberal world order we're going to call it that, faces its greatest crisis since the end of the Cold War. Liberalism is in retreat across the world, including in the West itself. I think that the concept of a rules-based international order has become largely devoid of substance. It is no longer clear what the rules are, who sets them, what moral authority underpins them, and who obeys them. At the same time, though, if the, if the liberal world order is in crisis, there is little sign of a new world order taking its place. Instead, I believe what we have is not a new world order, but a new world disorder. And this new world disorder is characterized by lack of clarity about international rules, by the relative weakness of great powers, the worst crisis of leadership since the 1930s, the collapse of political ethics, multiple divisions over ideology and identity, and an increased likelihood of major power conflict. And what we've seen in the response to coronavirus is that nations operate not according to international norms or shared values, they operate according to narrow conceptions of self national self-interest. So who is responsible for this crisis? Question two. Now, it's very fashionable these days to blame China especially, but also Russia for the crisis of global order. 
And there is no doubt that many of their actions have been truly egregious. I'm not here to defend Chinese and Russian foreign policy. However, the crisis of liberalism and the liberal world order has been largely self-inflicted. Historian Arnold Toynbee used the term suicidal statecraft and Spigniew Brzezinski used that in relation to the Iraq war. But I think since the Iraq war, over the last 15, 16 years, longer than that, the United States and much of the West has been engaged in a, a course of suicidal statecraft. Typically, three main problems. First, they have failed, the West, Western democracies have failed to live up to the principles underpinning a liberal international order. We've instead witnessed the emergence of a new normal. By the way, I agree, predates Trump. It's an American exceptionalism with few, if any, moral and political constraints. Now, this is not only morally objectionable, but it has also given Moscow and Beijing a license to act as they see fit. The second problem, the moral failure has been compounded by disastrous policymaking, you name it, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, the global financial crisis. Western ineptitude has encouraged China, Russia, and others not only to feel self-righteous, but also empowered. The West has never seemed so ineffectual. It is no longer a model for much of the rest of the world to follow. And then the third problem is that the West itself is fragmenting. Transatlantic relations are worse now than they have been since the Suez crisis in 1956. Europe is riven by widening political, economic, and cultural divisions. And just, it's even debatable whether there is even such a thing as a unitary West. Because despite talk of shared values, it's unclear what those values are and the extent to which they are shared. So what are we going to do about this? Well, I think it's fair to say that there's no silver bullet to the crisis of the liberal order. But there are a number of approaches, and just I'll run through these very quickly. The first is we need to get real, not realist. It's time to dump the notion that international politics revolves around the great powers, because I believe they have seldom been more impotent, not just the United States. But and I think traditional great power diplomacy is simply not capable of dealing with the complex problems that we all face today. The second issue. We need to focus on 21st century problems, not old fashioned geopolitical rivalries. Of course, these exist, but our sense of priorities has been badly distorted. The most obvious priority, clearly, the most immediate priority is managing the global pandemic. But I think the threat of climate change is even larger and more devastating in its consequences. Third issue. We have to take responsibility. Blaming Beijing and Moscow for our troubles, it's a cop-out. Whining does not make for effective policy, as we've seen with the Trump administration's abject response to coronavirus. We need to also compete better. Western democracies have to show that not just that they're virtuous, but that they're effective. The West won the Cold War against the Soviet Union because it showed that it was more effective. It could deliver better. We face a similar challenge today vis-a-vis -vis China and much of the non-West. We have legitimacy rests ultimately on performance. We have to be better at what we do. We also have to work with others. One of the for decades, the great advantage of the West was that it could work with its allies. It had a, 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 a community of nations that shared many of the same values, had common interests. Now, this advantage, this comparative advantage has been badly eroded and it needs to be rebuilt if the liberal order is to have a future. Otherwise, the West, the very idea of the West is going to uh, become extinct and sooner than we think. And we need to think also more flexibly about global governance. Now, this means rethinking US global leadership. Now, clearly, America can indeed must be an agenda set, but it also needs to be more consultative and less self regarding And finally, I believe that the future is multilateral. Now, that may seem counterintuitive given the 
uh, the failures and limitations of multilateral institutions. But if coronavirus has demonstrated one great truth, it is that our interests and our problems transcend national boundaries, and therefore so must our solutions. Thank you. Wow, I have about 15 more questions for each of you, but I promise not to indulge. We'll jump right into our discussion and then we will get to audience questions uh, in about 15 minutes. My first question, I'll start with Lisa. Here, as you know, we're here today to talk about all of this context of illiberal and liberal world order. So in the context of the three great powers currently in the global arena, Russia, China, and the United States. Although the America first foreign policy was certainly not unique to President Trump's administration, as you all have said, its application was more robust and marked by a forthright retreat from global institutions and multilateral. How will things change for the United States' continued role in our global order with President-elect Biden? And can it change in the U.S. administration alone stop America's retreat from global order? Lisa. Thank you. Um, well, certainly Biden has said he wants to change things. He want, he's, America is back. Uh, he wants to be involved. He has a liberal vision for the world and, and a vision of working with partners, reconstructing alliance, or re, I should say, rebuilding relationships, and also uh, working to address issues with, with science and expertise. The problem is, uh, as you all know, he's working with a divided government and a very divided pop populace. And the extent to which Biden is going to be able to get anything done really depends on our domestic political situation and whether uh, folks in the Senate are willing to go along and whether we can tamp down polarization in this country. Um, I, I, I am not confident that that's the case, but that needs to be the case is what I would say. Uh, and, and he has partners in the world uh, that will look to cooperate with him. Uh, and so, so this is the best we can hope for at this point. Excuse me, Chris or Bobo, additional thoughts on that? Chris first. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I think the problem that we have to really wrestle with there is at two two different levels, as I tried to point out in my introductory remarks. One, there's a challenge to liberalism from within, both in the United States and Western Europe. There's also an external challenge, and with Bobo and I may disagree here. I think it's more geopolitical than it is than it is ideological, although I see the American foreign policy establishment trying to dredge up the embers of the first Cold War with the Soviet Union and transform, transfer them into the Sino-American relationship, which I think is very diff, very dangerous thing to do. And I think we need to keep certain problems separated from other problems. The, the reality of great power politics has never gone away. So when people said it was the end of history, that was the most naive and foolish thing history doesn't end and history doesn't take sides it just goes on um and now we see that yes great power politics has returned because of the rise of china and there's a highly competitive relationship taking form between the us and china but if you can sort of separate out the geopolitics and find a way to manage that does hopefully open the way for the US and China to collaborate on other issues. I think we all agree that climate change and things like pandemics are important. Um, so I guess we have to sort of learn to compartmentalize how we approach our policy towards China. And again, I think um, to do what people like Secretary Pompeo and Vice President Pence have done in various statements they've made the last uh, four years and sort of divide the world into a competition between liberalism and democracy versus horrible communist Chinese authoritarianism, a dangerous, dangerous course of action. And that promotes real confrontation 
And the more confrontation there is, the less cooperation there will be on these other issues. Bobo? Yeah. Um, so just uh, a, a couple of points there. I think Biden is just the start of the solution. I think if there had been a second Trump term, I think it really would have been game over for the liberal world order, even the myth of a liberal world order. So the fact that Biden is hopefully going to be inaugurated on the 20th of January at least gives the liberal world order a shot at the title. You know, there is there is at least an opportunity to to address some of these more fundamental problems that Lisa and, and Chris have, have talked about. Um, but it's only the start. There are, the problems are so profound, the weaknesses are so profound that if we think, oh, well, look, it's okay because Biden is now going to be in the White House, and we're kidding us. We're going to go down in flames, really. That, now, just on geopolitics and ideology, I totally agree uh, with Chris on the uh, unhelpful ideological element. He mentioned this in his latest uh, foreign affairs article, and he was bang on, I thought. But there is geopolitic, geopolitical competition. I'm not, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that geopolitics is anachronistic. It exists. But what we have to do is see the bigger picture. It's far more serious than geopolitical rivalry between the United States and China, which is to some extent inevitable, are these massive transnational threats, like pandemics, like uh, climate change. I mean, what um, great power confrontation in recent times has led to mm -hmm. 250,000 American lives lost? I mean, the, the numbers are just extraordinary, really. So we need to think about areas where we can work together. We have to accept the reality of geopolitical competition, but we also have to look beyond geopolitical competition and try and work together, difficult though that is, to address these fundamental global threats will be uh, with us for decades. Can I? Sure, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to say, in terms of the geopolitical competition, I see the United States having made some very important mistakes. China, yes, is rising, but it it, it doesn't it doesn't have to continue to rise relatively to the United States. We have made some some really serious errors. Similarly, I agree with Bobo about multilateralism and working with partners to uh, allay some of those threats and to work on improving our weaknesses. And when I think about where we are today, I think in terms of um, it, I'm brought back to the late 60s, early 70s, which brought the US to detente with the Soviet Union and wondering about the US in a weakened position, but not giving up in a weakened position, looking for ways to co cooperate where it can, but, but also challenge as it must. And, and those are, are, I think, are really important. And I'll bring one back favorite, one back thing in that my students who are watching will know is one of my favorites. I think about George Kennan telling us to take care of our power interests, absolutely, but we must be true to what is good about the United States and what makes us special and attractive. So I'll just leave it there. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. So let's talk a bit more about Russia. It's, it's hard to pick <laughs> Russia, China, the United States, but let's move to Russia for a moment. And it's the other player that we're focusing on today. It's no secret that Vladimir Putin has often acted in direct conflict with global order norms. In fact, Bobo, you've written about how we might even consider calling it the new global disorder, as you alluded to in your opening remarks. Can you describe for us how Putin played a role in creating or elevating this disorder? Perhaps give an example that's not on the front page of the newspapers. Sure. Is Russia positioned at this point to dictate its version with the types of actions we're seeing from Putin? Um, the short answer, no. It's not sufficiently strong to be a real player in shaping a future world order or even bringing about a great new world disorder. But the thing that we need to uh, remember about Putin is he's essentially an opportunist. 
he looks for the little gaps in power, the lack of clarity, little areas where he can maybe make a difference or seize an opportunity. So Putin is not so much, a, you know, all this nonsense about him being a sort of a chess player. Yeah, that's, that's rubbish. He's a poker player. He's, a, he's a, someone who always looks out for the main chance. And in strategic terms, that means that he thinks he aims to promote Russia as an independent center of global power. How do you do that when the other two power, major powers, China and the United States, are so much stronger? Well, what he does is he tries to maintain strategic flexibility, a balance, if you like, between China and uh, the United States. So right now, of course, everyone's focused on the partnership with uh, with China. But in fact, Putin has been very careful to give himself other options as well. He never forecloses. And so that's the key with him, opportunism and strategic flexibility. I would also say, and this goes back to our previous conversation, that there is an ideological battle going on, but it's the ideological battle between liberalism and illiberalism. And you see Putin as an important voice in making that argument as well as she, but I, I know Putin better, so that's where I, I will talk. And, and that's been really important in helping to and and certainly the actions that he's taken uh, and his and so and Russia has taken to to foment and fuel um, opposition within democratic societies against the democratic project and advocating for traditional values, which they argue um, are contrary to to Western values that that seek to include more people, um, that see equality of women as important, and that um, and that are that assert the rule of law and protections for liberties. So this is a really important element, and with this advancement of nationalism, that helps also to undermine an extreme nationalism, to undermine things like the European Union, which is so essential for maintaining um, peace and security and uh, and prosperity, as well as American politics, uh, American democracy and other democracies around the world. Can I just jump in for a moment? You know, I, following this debate closely, as we all do, I, one thing that strikes me is I think to, to blame Putin for interfering with the electoral process or for stirring up trouble in Europe or the United States, and that's the reason why democracy in trouble, that's a cop out. Democracy is exactly. in trouble yeah. because we haven't performed. You know, where does political polarization come from? Where does economic inequality come from? Where does the loss of good you know, industrial yeah. manufacturing jobs come from? That's where our system has failed. And that's why there's a lot of discontent. Um, but also, I know this is a terrible thing to do, just step up and say, well, you know, if you looked at the world from the Kremlin's point of view, um, they have reason not to be terribly happy with the United States or the European Union. Um, you know, how wise was it for the US to expand NATO to the east? particularly the second round when the United States encouraged taking in the Baltic states. I mean, that's actually not just my favorite phrase for American policymakers who are experts on Russia. I'm sure Bobo knows as well. The post-Soviet space. I love that term, except it overlooks the fact that the post-Soviet space was pretty much the pre-Soviet space. <laughs> now, Russia had four or five hundred years as a great power in an empire and it has its own definition of what its interests are particularly geographically and it seems like the united states was not willing to recognize those interests when the cold war ended and i think when the archives are opened up um if they haven't been destroyed 50 years from now we'll find that the uh, u.s intelligence agencies had a considerable role in uh, the Maidan revolution in Ukraine. And Adam Tooze in his new book, Crash, actually does have some documentation about the EU's role in that. And so 
Yeah, that's not saying that the EU isn't important in its own sphere. It is saying that sort of this liberal missionary impulse to expand uh, our, quote, universal values, unquote, um, creates trouble. So I always ask my students in class, if our liberal values are so universal, why do we have to fight so many wars to get people to accept them? Um, but they're not universal. And I think that's the, one of the first things, if we're going to move forward on any of these projects, uh, we have to recognize that is, in fact, the case. Indeed. All right. So we see that both Putin and President Xi have consolidated their power. In China, the two-term limit on the presidency was abolished in 2018. And in Russia, a 2020 referendum assured Putin's tenure until at least 2036. How do you guys anticipate their extended rule contributing to the future of global order? And specifically, do you think that other smaller nations or smaller blocs see that consolidation, confirmation, and concentration of power as a reason to consider aligning with places like China and Russia? because they seem more predictable and more stable, particularly in light of how the recent American elections and recent administration has acted on the global stage. Bobo? Okay, um, that, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would answer this, uh, answer the question by saying that if China and Russia thought they were going to attract people to their model, their, their, you know, that they stood there as sort of effective governments and effective countries, then they've done a pretty poor job. Because we look at China and we think, well, you know, they, they managed to address the, uh, the pandemic pretty effectively. But in the course of that, they mismanaged abysmally the international politics of coronavirus. I cannot remember a time since Tiananmen Square in 1989 when there was such an international backlash against China. And I don't just mean in the United States or Western Europe, but also many other countries, including, by the way, in Central Asia, many of China's neighbors. So China thought it could somehow project Itself as this good international citizen, um, it's actually doing a pretty poor job of it. And that and then we turn to Russia. Russia too. People look at Russia and they think powerful. Uh, you don't want to sort of annoy them, but are they a model for you to follow? Absolutely not. And so I think this is the, the, the paradox, the irony, is that the United States and Europe even though they've made so many mistakes, have a better chance of being a model for other countries than either China or Russia, even with all the blunders that they've made over the, particularly the last 15, 20 years. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. So there is a chance for the liberal order, maybe not to resurrect itself in the, as the classic post-Cold War liberal order, but in some sort of, liberal form, yes, I think it, it, it's got a better shot at the title than either Beijing or uh, Moscow. Chris, do you have thoughts on this one? Well, I certainly agree that uh, Bobo is correct in pointing out that uh, China's done a lot of things that have antagonized other states and raised geopolitical fears in other states. And for those, for those of us who enjoy diplomatic history and think that's an important part of studying international politics, uh, there's a strong temptation, and I think the well-founded temptation, to look at the comparison between China and the U.S. today and Wilhelmine Germany and Great Britain in the run-up to World War I. Um, but that ties right into Bobo's point, and I think the thing that Wilhelmine Germany did that really consolidated opposition to Germany's rise in pre-World War I is that it, there was sort of like an 800 pound gorilla throwing its weight around mm -hmm. and doing one thing after another to not just antagonize the other great powers, but to raise their fears. And yeah, I think under Xi, China has not 
done a terribly good job with its public diplomacy. So, but here's the question, and I don't, I don't know the answer, but it's a great question. If you look at uh, ASEAN every couple of years, publishes this nice compilation of pie charts showing the composition of ASEAN's trade with uh, other partners. And if you go back to, I think, 1992, which is the first year, China barely registered on that chart. Mm. The U.S. was pretty impressive. We were up around 18%. Today, it's completely flipped. And so when you look at these other states in East Asia that um, are sort of caught in the middle, you wonder, how how is this going to play out? Is security going to be the predominant concern and cause them to ultimately align with China or um, against China, pardon me, align with the U.S. against China, or our economic realities, they're close, not just interdependence, but really dependence on China economically going to push them into Beijing's orbit. But yeah, I mean, the, the question is how much, how much does China's economic clout compensate for their sort of blunderbuss diplomacy that they have, pardon me, wolf warrior diplomacy <laughs> over the last several years. I'll just say one thing. Um, I think that the extension of these leaders' terms is actually a sign of weakness and will yeah. not, especially, especially for Putin, 20 years and he's going to 36 years i think that that is not something that most citizens of the world or most political elites if they're not the, the head honcho want to see repeated in their mm -hmm. states uh, and i also would argue that with this long-standing rule becomes increasing corruption which is a huge problem in both russia and china it undermines the economy it undermines social uh development and and this is not a uh, i mean in the short run for Xi and Putin, uh, and for some who see this as stabilizing, yes, but I think if we take the long run, these are uh, these are signs of weakness um, and, and they, they, they don't bode well for both states. Well, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to be the uh, person who throws cold water you can. on everything <laughs> or the snake at the garden party, but yes, you know, what Lisa says, absolutely right. And we know that, in fact, one of the reasons why Xi has consolidated his power is precisely to fight the, the corruption mm -hmm. in the Chinese system. Yeah, there is corruption, but I think we ought not to avert our eyes from kind of the corruption that is embedded in the American political system. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> the, Iron, I'm not. the Iron Triangle, for example, between uh, the Pentagon congressional uh, districts uh, and uh, defense contractors, or the role of lobbyists at K Street in Washington. There's an awful lot of corruption in the American system. I think, unfortunately, corruption seems to be part of politics. But I don't think that, yeah. I don't think that should divert us, as I think many analysts of Sino-American relations are tempted to do, and just, oh, China can't compete with us. China can't innovate. Their system won't work. It's going to fall apart. I think of Gordon Chang, particularly. I don't want to name names, yeah. but I always tell my class, <laughs> there he is. He's been predicting with metronomic regularity since yeah. uh, 2001. <laughs> China is about to collapse. Well, it, I guess by his standard, it's still about to collapse, but it hasn't yet. And yeah. I think that tends to, you know, cause us to overlook the ways in which China's government has performed for the Chinese and the rise of living standards, tremendous uplift in uh, uh, reduced reduction of poverty. Well, you know, when you, I, I don't know if you guys are as addicted to Gideon Rockman as I am, the chief <laughs> financial commentator of the Financial Times. And I always feel like I have a Vulcan mind melt with him. I'll be sitting around and on the weekend and talking with my wife, who's a faculty colleague of mine here at Texas A&M, I said, well, talk about China, because I can't stop talking about China. 
And then Tuesday morning, I'll open up the Financial Times and get in column will be there and say the same thing. But, you know, he had a column about how the Chinese leaders like to come to the West and say that we're just a poor developing country and sort of, I guess, try to allay Western fears of China's increasing wealth and power. But when you go there, it's not a poor developing country. I mean, maybe in the far West or, or the in, internal, but on the, on the East Coast, you have a highly developed country and economy that's twice the size of the United States in terms of population, nearly twice the size. So, you know, we shouldn't underrate our own problems in performance, our own problems with corruption, and allow this sort of image of China to divert us from the real strengths of this country as a rising great power, or even a risen great power. I'll take a quick comment from Bobo and an audience question. Just very quickly. Um, I find a lot of Western uh, analyses, perceptions of China and Russia uh, go to one of two extremes, sometimes both extremes. But they lurch from the extreme of saying, oh, these countries, they're bound to fail because you know, uh, they, they don't share our values, they, they're not democracies, therefore they are doomed to fail because good will triumph in the end. Or, or they go to the other extreme, which is that China and Russia pose an existential threat to the liberal world order. These uh, that we over, sometimes we're guilty of estimating their capacity. So we tend to, for example, look at China as this unstoppable, monolithic juggernaut, when in fact it has many weaknesses, divisions. They they obviously managed to um, massage that information much better than some, some of us can over here. But the thing is, we go from this extreme of, of, uh, of total dismissal on the one hand to almost total fear on the other. And, and, and we really need to try and get a, a more of a sense of proportion here. And we do need to break for audience questions here. We've got just about 10 minutes left. I'd like to, um, as, as is our custom here, I invite a young person to challenge our ideas and give us um, her thoughts. Excellent. So we've got Noelle McClellan, a junior at Julia R. Masterman High School here in Philadelphia to ask our first audience question of the evening. Noelle? Um, so my question is, comparatively, how have the governments of the United States, Russia, and China taken advantage of the pandemic and all of its repercussions to impact the liberal world order. Thank you. Lisa, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, I'll start with the U.S. Uh, I mean, the U.S. pulls out of the World Health Organization and we don't uh, work together with allies to try to come up with ways to manage or and, and to promote uh, better policies. So it, it's uh, it's very dangerous. We run a very dangerous path. Um, if you compare this to what Obama did in the Obama administration did with Ebola or what the Bush administration did for H W Bush did for a HIV AIDS, um, it's it's really shocking. Uh, and um, and and so th uh, the liberal order has been really harmed. Uh, even though, I mean, I don't want to be seen as somebody who is is uh, uh, raving about the World Health Organization. It has its problems, but uh, but we need those institutions, and we need uh, to cooperate. As Bobo said, this is these kinds of questions are collective action problems. These these have to be dealt with uh, by by multiple actors working together to solve them. And I'll let my panelists talk some more about other countries. Um, yeah, uh, so I know this sounds a, a, perhaps a slightly crass way to put it, but who's had a good coronavirus uh, or the better coronavirus? Well, I think there's no doubt that the United States has had the worst coronavirus. Um, I mean, the numbers don't lie. Um, the approach has been 
just shocking. It, it's converted the United States in many people's eyes to the ultimate anti-modern. And that's, it doesn't have to stay that way. We really hope things are going to change. But people look at the United States and they don't just think, oh, look, they, they put some bad policies. Oh, Trump is eccentric or aggressive or whatever. They just look at the sheer staggering level of ineptitude and bad policy making. They think, no, we don't want that. Now, the Russians, the Russians have also had a very poor pandemic very high infection rates, early stages, Putin showed it almost as great <clears throat> a lack of interest as uh, Trump did, and uh, the death rates, mortality rates are going up. So um, they've also had a poor pandemic. China, as I mentioned, has had a so-called good pandemic domestic in, in, in that they've been able to get on top of it. Internationally, pandemic has actually been very bad news for China because it's actually shown of whereas China um, has international reputation benefited from its role in helping to fix the global financial crisis 2008 what we've seen is the reverse it's actually uh, converted a lot of uh, countries that were more or less well disposed to China into countries that either resented or were increasingly suspicious of China and so it's not done well either. Yeah, I just want to throw in, I think it certainly has not gone well for the US, has not gone well for China, um, but it's also not gone well for the EU. And yeah, I agree. <laughs> yes. this, this body that many Americans, and I plead guilty to this, despite having a spouse who is an expert on the European Union. So we have a lot of trouble comprehending the supranational institution composed of nation states, but it's supposed to stand for cooperation, for common approaches to dealing with problems. Mm -hmm. And not only did we see it sort of fail in that respect with the Euro crisis a few years ago, um, but we've seen it really fall back into that national interest first paradigm with respect to the pandemic. So, you know, when, when you see an instrument an institution like the EU have problems. So, well, if they can't handle a coordinated response, what optimism should we have for you know, other international institutions uh, to do that? And that's troublesome because everyone, I think we all agree, unless there's coordination and collaboration um, at the international level, things like pandemics and climate change cannot be effectively addressed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. We've got just a few minutes left, so I'll combine a few themes I'm seeing on questions here and ask you each for just one quick answer to the same question. You've all talked about how American exceptionalism, democracy, the liberal world order hinges on performance, right? You have to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. What is one thing that stands out to you as something that the United States could do? to shift the scales back, to perform and to deliver or reset their moral high ground to help swing away from the disorder that we've talked about. A quick answer each and then we'll wrap up. Lisa, we'll start with you. Oh boy. Um, we need, yeah, one thing. Um, we need to take seriously the people who are hurting and there are even more people who are hurting now. Uh, and so really important investment in making sure that people get back to work. And I would also say making sure that we understand and putting people back to work, we have to consider race, ethnicity and gender about who is getting those jobs. Uh, because this pandemic has has hurt people disproportionately, but we do have to deal with uh, economic dislocation that has been going on for 30 years and has been uh, and has been ignored as we pursued this neoliberal project for economics without having a, a state that would uh, would help people. Chris, well, I don't really have much to add to what Lisa said. So I think she's right. I think we can say that uh, what used to be the Washington consensus on neoliberal economics has now become the Washington dissensus uh, in a way. I mean, 
clearly, and this, this again illustrates the problem, the difficulty of reconciling national level interests with international cooperation. I mean, jobs move when firms are incentivized to make profits and they can produce products cheaper in other countries, they're, they're, they're going to do so if they're given the opportunity. And, you know, we could, we could spend another, what, year doing this conversation, talking about how do you solve these economic problems created by neoliberalism? But clearly, you know, if you don't solve the problem of good jobs disappearing abroad, being offshore, if you don't solve the problem of economic inequality, and all the political consequences that attend to that, uh, you're going to have trouble, and, and democracy will be in trouble. And that's one of the reasons, the prime reason, I would say, why there has been this backlash, both in the US and in Europe. I mean, the, the one thing Trump discovered was how to, to tap into the discontent out there in middle America, where, you know, the region that's really been damaged by uh, outsourcing of, of good paying jobs to uh, to China and other places. So that's that's a real challenge for the future of democracy. Got to find out how to how to repair these economic issues. Economic development, surely. So what were closing that? Yep. Um, I think the United States can lead, but it can't lead in the way it used to. It it can't be. It can't always present itself as this beacon on the hill, the greatest country in the world. It needs to demonstrate. It needs to show a kind of leadership. So what's the most important issue in the world today? In my opinion, it is climate change. It's combating climate change. If the United States wants to lead the world by example, by the power of its technology, by the power of its values, then it needs to take a much more vigorous leadership role in combating climate change. And I'm glad to see that Joe Biden is already starting to move in that direction. Powerful statement, thank you. And I'd like our audience to give a virtual thank you, which our panelists can't hear, but I'm sure is out there. <laughs> To thank our speakers tonight, Lisa, Chris, and Bobo, as well as their sponsors who make this nonpartisan civil programming possible. The Hobbs School of Business at St. Joseph's University and Key Bank. Thank you to our members for, for your deeply appreciated support and to all for sharing your thoughts on democracy and the new world order with us tonight. The third and final installment of this series called Democracy on the Table, where we'll dive into hotspots around the world like Venezuela, Belarus, and beyond, will happen mm -hmm. on December 9th. This Thursday, the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, we, uh, we at the World Affairs Council here, we're very excited to host the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United States. She is the first female ever appointed to an ambassador role from the kingdom. And she's joining us here for an intimate conversation this Thursday at 4 p.m. Please do consider joining us and ask your questions to the kingdom. With that, I wish you all safety and sanity, and thank you for tuning in. Good evening. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.